your family? Is it your friends? Um, is it you know people you see regularly? What is home? So usually home is linked to positive emotions, um, although sometimes I think it can bring up sadness, melancholy, even trauma for some people. Um, and if it does that for anybody, then I apologize. But one thing about home is that we do often think about it more because of loss, because of displacement, because of being away from it, and not often enough in terms of the positives of you know what it means to have it or what it might be for us. But probably home is a combination of um, the things that I said above, some of them, some things I didn't mention maybe, but I would hazard that for most of you, if not all of you, home is a place, a specific place, a place to which you feel some attachment, a place that's part of your identity in some way. And yet this connection of identity and place has also been highly contested um, and much discussed by human geographers, by philosophers, by politicians and by many others. And I think the crux of the debate is often the meaning of place. So what does place itself mean? For people like David Harvey, place is, I quote, like time and space, a purely social construct. For Manuel Castells, places are networks. Um, spaces of flows, and then for Doreen Massey, a quote again, place is formed out of the particular set of social relations which interact at a particular location. So Massey anchors a social construct in a location, but the location itself doesn't really seem to matter that much beyond being this platform for interaction. So for her, place, and by extension home, is a social construct as well. I think one of the principal reasons why these people focus so much on the social construct element is that they have a deep, wary, Hello, uh, you. terribly unfashionable boundaries and of place identity. So in this talk, I want to think about the boundaries of place and the link between place and identity, and then move to the role of location of material aspects like architecture and landscape with regards to a very specific kind of place, namely home. So now for another thought experiment. This is um, it's an aerial shot of Garzweiler 2, which is a gigantic open coal pit in Western Germany. And as that expanded more and more, leaving aside the climate policy of, of the country, it consumed several villages in its path. And one of them was a place called Immerat. And here the entire community, including the cemetery, was relocated to nearby new builds, you know, before the houses, the church, the sports grounds, everything was demolished. So if we think that place and home are a purely social construct, then that shouldn't really matter that much. You know, the people could go about living, living their lives, having the same social relations in those new builds, and the facilities might even be better, you know, more up to date. So they could they could even keep on honoring their dead because we moved them. So you might think as a social construct, it doesn't matter. But do you think that they feel like they lost their home nonetheless? Or in this case, that's the um, former Acorn estate in Peckham. Have these people lost a bit of their identity? Just going to leave that as a rhetorical question for now. So I want to say that there's another school of thought about place, and that's a topological one, which is inspired by phenomenology. And it says that place is not the product of experience, but rather that it's the other way around, that place is the foundation of experience, the starting point. Essentially, they're saying because we are embodied selves that live in each of our own very specific here and now, we're affected by the singularity of place. And in other words, place is pre-personal. That's not to say that the meaning of place is necessarily fixed and static and unchangeable, but that instead of being fluid, it's maybe more viscous. It takes a while to shape it. So that reminds me of Karl Marx's dictum that people make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-elected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already. Um, given and transmitted from the past. So these circumstances are larger than the self and they're communal for better or worse and they pervade everything about place. 
So indeed, place as opposed to space is both physical and immaterial. It comprises the past and the present, the landscape, the architecture, as well as the people, the histories and the myths. And that combination of pre-personal elements is, I think, what makes each place singular. These are the elements that we thought about maybe earlier when we thought about home, that immaterial and physical element. And that's what, to me, defines place, define in the literal sense of drawing a line, of drawing boundaries, to which Harvey and Massey and the others are so vehemently opposed, because I think they have a rather rigid conception of boundary. So Nigel, Nigel Thrift says that there is no such thing as a boundary, it doesn't exist. For Harvey, boundaries are by necessity reactionary and exclusive, so there's already a political interpretation of boundary. But boundaries don't need to be hermetic by necessity. In fact, boundaries are not only necessary for the notion of place, but they also have the potential of being generative, of being positive. Um, as Geraldine Pratt says, for example, making boundaries, insisting on materiality and persistence of differences may be as politically productive as blurring them in notions of mobility, hybridity and third space. So the notions of self and community require an other. Being part of a community suggests that you can also not be part of a community, so that there is an inside and an outside. So somewhere in between there is a boundary. And that itself is not a bad thing. It's the way that one engages with these that matters. Um, and that's what happens at the edge, that engagement with the other. So the way that boundaries are drawn is essential because the edges are in the end what constitute the topos. So in my work, I explore the boundaries of home, or more specifically, the notion of Heimat. Heimat is a German term that would take too long to explain, but to put it simply, Heimat is a geographically anchored notion of belonging that bestows identity through a shared imaginary inspired by place. And the key thing here is that it's communal, it's wider than the self, although scale is also one of the questions that I address, um, but I'm not going to go into that now. So what I'm using as a concept of boundaries is Heidegger's gathering fourfold. So Heidegger, <coughs> sorry, Heidegger uses the term, the term geführt, and that's not an adjective, but a noun, and it means quadrangle or square in the architectural sense. And the four sides of the geführt are earth, which is material space, the physical here, sky, which is space through time, so the duration spent in a particular place with attention to detail and to the changes, and that is often experienced poetically as well. So, for example, the romantic seasons, noting how, how things might change over time and having an affinity for that. Third one is mortals, which is that um, quite convoluted point, but basically Heidegger says that because we're mortal, um, our finality is what makes things particular. So it situates our experience and makes it specific. So ephemerality is what makes this place, this particular place, these people, these people, what makes me, me, and what makes this room, this room. And the fourth one, the final one is gods or deities. And that's the ethos of place, we could say. That's what Yifu Tuan calls the established values that are in place and that give us stability and security. And that's often told in folklore or, for example, in statues, which brings us back full circle because they're a material manifestation of this immaterial element. Now, again, it would probably take a long time to explain this idea of Heimat and the fourfold in detail, but that should hopefully be enough to give you a rough idea for now. But basically, the fourfold is this attempt to understand boundaries and it's clear that it's both material and immaterial, that there is myth and tradition and poetry. But, um, um, and that's why I use literature as an approach. But as I've said, the material aspects of place matter too, and that's what I want to focus on now. So location is more than just this platform for social relations. It also gives meaning. So now for the rest of this talk, I want to think about the role of architecture in Heimat. So that earth element specifically. And I want to do that with regards to the city. Now I need to say, sorry. I need to say that um, 
this is very much a work in progress. I'm only just starting on this chapter, um, and I'll talk to Christoph about it afterwards as well. But um, I'll be very interested in your thoughts if you have them. So do do make notes and do um, challenge as well, because this what's coming next, I think, to me is more of an essay in a French sense. It's a trialing of thoughts, and um, I hope we can discuss them afterwards together. So now let's look at this picture that I had on the flyer and the announcement. And yeah, the neat link with a fourfold isn't the only reason why I chose it, but um, that does give a quite literal sense of architecture as a boundary. You know, it might be trivial to point it out, but yes, the built environment that we see here draws limits naturally. It can explicitly mark the inside and the outside. And uh, the extreme example is, of course, gated communities. But um, but there's also more to it, I think, because the boundaries of architecture are also, they permit actions, they allow for movement or not. You know, we, see, we see a bridge very faintly in the back there. We see roads, we see, you know, a railway line might be, might be limiting access. Um, and then we can think of elevated walkways as well. Um, so all of this has an effect and can have very unintended consequences as well. So here, this is a quote from a poem by Caleb Femi. Um, about the North Peckham estate. The architect maintained that their design was a good solution because of the times. It is true on paper, there were no designs for a tomb, yet the east wing stairs where Wadamilola was found. So yes, boundedness, permeability, all of that matters, but it's not what I want to focus on. As I said before, I want to think about the generative aspects of boundaries and about belonging in that regard. Another example is from Guy Gunaratne's novel In Our Mad and Furious City, where the narrator describes the fictional Stones estate where the entire novel is set. And that's one modelled on a real one in Neasden in northwest London. So here the place in, so is, inspires this in the narrator. Ours was a language, a dubbing of noise, while theirs was a one note, void of new feeling in any sense of place. Place was our own, this place. So again, we see specificity here. And then there are phrases throughout the novel, like he's off estate, not from these ends, which recur all the time. And they show clearly that there's a community defining element of these boundaries. And we can think of other examples like um, so-called gay villages, for example, which are very clearly delineated parts of cities. Or we can think of what geographers Lees and Hubbard call the good ghetto, which are also clearly defined, but also then create this positive sense of belonging through it. So there is this sense of inside and outside, but it is positive. Let's go back to this picture. What does it make you feel when you look at this? The title, as you can see, is Meet Me in Arcadia. I'm not sure Arcadia is, is your first thought when you see this picture. And, you know, the photographer Ruth Blaise Luxembourg, Luxembourg probably uses it fairly tongue in cheek. But to me, it also does highlight that um, imaginary aspect of it, that there is an act of poesis that is involved in place. And the sense of Heimat is deeply connected to an aestheticization of place, to a kind of romance. But that doesn't have to be stereotypically beautiful. It's more like Arden, who's a narrator in the novel that I just mentioned, who wants to be a grime MC, and he goes up to um, one of the tower blocks of the estate and looks down and says, I came up here to look at the ends at night because the view from the west block is as nice as it, as it is dismal in daytime. It looked like it was on fire, this place. Yellow windows and lights in distant black it looked sick. There's a few hours when these ends can rival that kind of romance too. So again, it's not necessarily for all of us, this kind of romance, but for the people there, or for some people there, it has that. And there are other real life examples of this. We can think of Joy White's book, Terraformed, which looks at the forest gate area in Newham. And she describes how the physical space leads to and fosters the creation of grime, which she then describes as a hyper-localized sound. So White says, grime and rap play a key role in the production of place as a setting, the physical built environment of the street corners, the estates, the stairwells and the basketball courts. So yes, that's architecture as a social enabler, but it's also an inspiration for the grime music that then feeds into place identity. So place becomes this foundation of experience 
And that's the interchange, that interconnectedness of architecture and of poetic meaning that makes specificity. Think of that phrase, hyper-localized sound. But then there's often a clash between the designers and architects on the one hand and the users of place, the residents on the other hand. Again, that's the inside and the outside. And that question is about who gets to build place. And I'm aware that I'm addressing a lot of architects here, but Femi also addresses this explicitly in several of his poems. And we've already seen it with that design tomb. Um, but another poem he has is called A Designer Talks of Home and a Resident Talks of Home. And that's set up as a transcript alternating between two the two eponymous characters. And um, you realize immediately that there's no real dialogue happening. So the designer says things like tactile memory, empathy is the cornerstone of design. It's all about showmanship and theatricality. It's about how things feel and smell as much as how they look. But then in between, Femi throws in these lines from the resident who interjects a real human experience. And that's, can we see it now? There's a wall full of RIPs. Mum reckons that's why they covered the rot with cladding, because concrete smells like a siege. And it's impossible not to be reminded of Grenfell, of course, but um, we get the tragic irony when then the designer says, design is a tool to enhance our humanity, a frame for life, putting the human experience at the beginning of the process. So it becomes, excuse me, it becomes clear that Femi would prefer pl to place the human experience at the end of the design process as well. So he's in essence saying that participatory design is not a finite process at all, but it's an ongoing one. Because in the end, Heimat is an active engagement, something that is constantly built and rebuilt by the community. So that wall full of RIPs, while it's deeply sad, is also interesting. It tells us a lot about the specificity of the material space. It's not just any wall, but it's that particular wall that is filled with RIPs. It's that wall that is imbued with memories. So throughout this talk, I've, I've put the physical space and architecture in juxtaposition with this symbolic, poetic place. And I think it's, a, it's evident that they, you can't separate them. It's not just one or the other. And the notion of Heimat requires an attunement to place as much as an element of ownership. There's this combination of participation, of ongoing active engagement, but also a knowledge of the pre-personal, an engagement with those symbolic meanings that are in there and that affect us. Remember the circumstances that are transmitted, marks, past, etc. So things like knowing the nooks and crannies of a place, knowing the shortcuts, knowing the little alleyways, knowing the comings and goings of people, knowing the sounds, the smells. But the idea of attunement also heightens the importance of that pre-personal. That's in architectural styles and materials. So think about what's conveyed by various terraces, you know, Georgian terrace, Victorian terrace of bay windows, brick. We we're talking about brick earlier. Think about um, that versus then tower blocks versus concrete, um, an estate that is surrounded or surrounding a courtyard, a sports ground. And then, you know, what does this picture make you feel? What does this one make you feel? So materials have local specificities or have a lack thereof, you know, red brick and timber and glass are very different. Concrete has associations. For some, it will be cold, it will be ugly, it will be brutal, which you know, might be a willful misunderstanding of the term brutalism. To others, it's modern, it's useful, it's even beautiful and safe. And then to others, it's part of home. Because concrete pervades Femi's collection. A lot, of, a lot of poems are called concrete, concrete one, two, three, four, five. It comes back a lot. And he does so much work to reframe the perception of concrete and of estates. So he then talks about voids like trees rooted in concrete in this soft, poetic way talks about concrete as a material that absorbs experience, talks about architectural styles, and these materials become the foundation of experience, as I've said. They're carriers of meaning. They're part of that pre-personal aspect of home. I'm coming to an end now, because I've probably bored a few and lost several people. But um, Femi has a prose poem called The Painting on the Concrete Wall. 
it's too long to quote, but in it, there's a wall that becomes this site of offering when a nine year old boy deposits all of his birthday presents there, asking for the safe return of his brother, whom we suspect have died, somehow related to crime, possibly in a burnt car. But what interests me here is that it's not planned. It's an emergent social construct, yes, but it's a site nonetheless. And it becomes the focal point for that community. What Pierre Nora calls a lieu de mémoire or a site of memory. That's a place, object or event that has become symbolic, a symbolic element of the memorial heritage and collective memory of any community. And that's the idea I want to leave you with today. Thinking about Heimat in the city, about place as a source of identity, both individual and communal, the role of architecture could maybe be that uh, to create a boundary in that generative sense. So to help define the limits by giving specificity and not just a platform. So the earth element is where we can grow roots. So it could be architecture could be to build sites of memory, not in the sense of memorials, not in a planned way, but sites of living memory, sites of experience. And more often than not, and I'm going to say this as a final provocation. Christoph likes it when I provoke architects. Um, it might mean less design. It might mean shifting ideas about participation, not to a part of the process, which is often a very early part, but as the final point, as the end point that then absorbs the poetic elements of place. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Julian for the talk and also for putting up with this um, slightly um, hybrid format of having a Teams and a physical audience. Um, I saw some hands go up during the um, presentation in the Teams channel and please hold those thoughts and please also feel free to either um, put your hand up again or to add your question to the chat. I think initially we should go to the respondents. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Um, so um, perhaps we should start off, if that's OK, Austin, with the uh, respondents. Um, yeah. That's OK, so I will just um, pass over the laptop if you're fine. Uh, yeah, OK. Uh, hi, everyone. So first, thank you, Julia, for your uh, presentation. Um, I um, really enjoyed you bringing up like the idea of boundaries and how we can limit space uh, but also like the physical boundary and um, like we, we, we um, like you you, you um, implied how architects are often complicit in manifesting like political power in a space or in other things so it's like the idea of politics of space and body and uh, I think of like uh, spatially I like it came to my mind three components of architecture like immediately like you have the wall you have the corridor and you have the key who transformed the the, the, the wall in uh, in like a door and um, the, the key <laughs> yeah so, uh, so yeah, like we start with the like we start with the line. The line uh, organize our organize our world and uh, organize bodies in space, organize life in space, and organize this whole idea of home. And um, like the line becomes after that a wall. And uh, um, sorry, uh, I don't know how to say this, but. I think that's uh, the, the most idea of how we can like uh, um, like the world being vanquished by people is like I have this idea of people walking in it or people sitting in it and um, yeah I think we, we, we it's um, it's definitely a major part of the of the whole process of making a place and thing and uh, for the corridor like within this notion of home it's something that you have inside and I just think about the bourgeois um, like habitat the Parisian bourgeois habitat where um, like the the corridor became the space where uh, the servants were able to like operate within the house and this was like their almost um, 
operates within the walls, like they were not really seen. And the key, like I say, is uh, what turns a door into a wall and uh, it's also defined who gets served by architecture and who get to be excluded by it. So it's serve and protect, but it can also uh, trap the bodies like the presence or other thing. But the key can also become obsolete when it de decides to be like violent. So I think that uh, even our uh, like physical, physical and material components of architect can be like vanquished or can be uh, like destructed almost. So yeah, I, I also had this idea of what can be a home like without like what is a home without doors also like it's what enclosed things like you, you, even the wall doesn't uh, like you can can manage something else and um, with the notion of home I have like this idea of uh, going from a little little scale to a more bigger one like you start from the, the body as your first first of all home and it's uh, from this point of uh, view that you have this person perception of space and what's all surrounding you. And then you come to the to the bed, I say, it's the individual space, like you say, my bed, even if you have, uh, I don't know, juridical problems and they came to take everything you have, they're not going to take your bed. So um, I think it's uh, also, an individual space, I say, and um, to that, I, like the the bed led also to other objects, who is significant but are not spatially here to like um, uh, embrace your body, I say. Um, then we go to the bedroom, and um, I don't know personally. I keep in mind all the places I have slept in, like I can uh, think of the whole bedroom and how it's sitting. And uh, yeah, this lead to the apartment, to like uh, the fact of moving in, moving out, and how you like move, when you're moving out, you have like uh, you have to dissemble thing, sort out thing, throw or give, and then leave. And where you move in, you clean, like you try. I don't know by by cleaning when you just move in, you like trying to erase all the other life that was, that was before, I'll say. And yeah, which leads us after that to another scale, which is the building and then the streets and uh, the neighborhood and the neighborhood life, the city. And with the city, we have this idea of uh, my own city and uh, a visiting city. And I think that uh, when it's your city, um, I find it more personal, but. I, I don't know all the like all the streets of Casablanca or Paris I lived in both, but I always have an idea of where they are. Mm, like and um, and I can't really be lost in my city. Like I have my landmarks. Um, yeah, and I have many places that are attached to a lot of memories, like a house I used to live in or a house of an old friend. A coffee shop I used to work in it or things like that. But what I'm visiting when I'm visiting a city, like um, the, I barely touch, I say the city or interact with it. I, like I uh, remember after the, the visiting, my uh, own indecision, I say an hesitant path. Like I won't have this adventurous, I say, state of mind. Uh, yeah. So I think. Uh, and uh, also, I think the idea of objects who contain memories is really, really important in that sense. And it reminds me of um, uh, Horan Pamuk, who is a, a Turkish writer who um, like tried to collect objects from his uh, city, from the city he grows up uh, in, and would have like a, a little boxes or things that have like a flower, but and then you, he just like uh, took all these objects and create a museum which you celebrate this idea of home. And I don't know by putting these objects who have a lot of memories in a space, 
it, it creates a sense so as I say like you won't live in it but you have this feeling of the in, in, in a home um, yeah I think uh, I think that's it for me <laughs> yeah. I'll uh, I'll have one question and um, like well, when you say that um, boundaries like are, are not always a bad thing but it's the way that we we, we engage in it um, how do you think like us as architects can uh, have a, i don't know a revolution, revolutionary agenda uh, throughout this idea of having i don't know boundaries but in a positive way mm. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, but I think if I, if I had a clear answer, I'm not sure. Um, I would be here, but, but uh, yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm not an architect, so I, I don't think I can really engage specifically with that question. But um, I think what, what I'm, I'm trying, trying to, to get at and, and what, what I'm, I'm trying, trying to see also is, is how architecture, you know, the built environment, can serve as a as a positive way. You know, we were talking before this about um, the difference the difference between you know buildings where the light shines on and they give off the sense of warmth and the buildings that don't have that. Um, but I think there's more to it than that. It's it's using architecture in a way that offers and I don't know. It's so hard to separate out. But uh, a reflection of our education as well that give this sense of of knowing where you are specificity. And I think that's something that a lot of people miss when they when they look at things that you know it's linked to globalization when you have this globalized architecture which doesn't give you that specificity. But I think architecture can play a role in that regard of being more more localized. I think that's, and that's what, what I mean about it. Not, not specifically, you know, like building, building a wall here to force movement, but, but, but being, being part of this place of this meaning generating of, of that identity. I don't, I don't think, think that, that makes sense, sense, does it? No, no. <laughs> so it's more, I, I say, like the materiality of it and the architecture being more than just an image we build or an object, but like in the city. I say, and um, it reminds me of a book of um, Johanny, I don't know if I pronounce it good, Palasma, and it's called uh, Le Regard des Sens. I, I don't know how. The to... Eyes of the Skin? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's it. And he, he really talk about this idea of having, like, we're, we're in an era where there's a lot of image and we have, like, an over image. And the architecture became one in a certain way. So he talks about the fact, the, the 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 way and how architecture can like interact with other senses. And I think you mentioned that with like the touch, the smell, or the noises also. Yeah. We have another hand up in the room. So. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, hopefully you can hear me on the screen. Um, you, you had Karl Marx up there, and obviously historical specificity is kind of key to a Marxist analysis and forgetting cultural specificity. But I'm just trying to work out where you are targeting your timescale of approach to this, because <clears throat> in some ways, I mean, this is a really good book. You should take a look at Confucius Courtyards, which is looking culturally specifically at the way that Chinese people see a home uh, and place. Uh, with relationship to heaven and, and earth, but uh, that's another story. But so first of all, you've, you know, you've taken us across Europe from Germany to, to to the UK and a bit of America thrown in there as well. But in terms of historical specificity, one of the key things is that depending on um, where you see ambition, where you see your progress and the notion of the future being either a good place to be or a bad place to be, so maybe you see the your relationship to home. 
people leave home because it's an ambitious thing to do. People retreat to home at the end of their lives because it's a safe place to be, maybe, right? But if you take a look at the way that China's developed in the last 30, 40 years, there was a very clear example uh, in Beijing of lots of Beijing residents complaining when a, a, a shop opened up showing historical images of Beijing in the 1920s because they didn't want to be reminded of the poverty and the squalor and all the rest of it, okay? Within 10 years, people were, were flocking to that shop to be reminded of you know, the, the, the old days and what they left behind because they felt that they'd lost something. So even in that small time frame within China, because it moved so fast, uh, there was a sense that history had moved on and they had a different approach. So looking at something in 2010 and looking at something in 2020, I think you can have completely different historical perspectives on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. Julian, you're mute, you're mute and we can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> right, sorry about that. Um, Yes, I was saying, uh, what was I saying? Yes, that um, it's interesting about new builds that sometimes you walk there and you don't get that sense of place yet, but um, but then you go back there and you do begin to feel it because it absorbs meaning and you yourself have changed as well. And I think there's a really interesting aspect of nostalgia that is um, that is linked to that. And nostalgia can can lead to really bad things, but it can also maybe bind you to a place in a more active way. And I think that's where with this notion of Heimat and why I prefer the, this idea of Heimat to home, which I go into at length in the introduction of my thesis. But um, I think Heimat also involves nostalgia in this lived way. So you, you keep practicing those things without sort of feeling necessarily that it has to remain fixed you know, traditions can evolve. And I think that's the, the thing that translates then into active engagement, where it's, um, I use that notion of, of more, um, more utopian engagement. So nostalgia is, it's turned not into this backward looking, but into this nostalgia for the better. And by this active engagement, you get rid of that fixity of meaning. And I think it still feeds in, as you say, you know, I mean, China's history can then feed into that place again later on, but that's because it is then embraced and it doesn't have to be applied top down. I think that's where also distinction between Heimat and like fatherland or motherland can be different in that it one is bottom up and the other one is imposed politically and is tried to, to be defined clearly as something fixed and not as something movable. So I don't think I agree with you, but we haven't got time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I have a few uh, notes I'd like to make, but it's it's not necessarily a question. I just think it's a very nice topic to be exploring now with the fact that so many people are moving in into the city. Uh, and for instance, China is developing Africa is or will be developing very soon. So the whole world is um, asking themselves probably what is home, how can we make the city a home, how can we preserve um, uh, the memory of our villages where we came from. And uh, yeah, I just think it's a fascinating topic. Um, and also there are wars in the Middle East and in various other places in the world that are happening. So yeah, I just think it's a fascinating topic and I'm looking forward to your research. Did anyone on Teams have a question or have a comment? I, I'm happy to read through my notes. I re really enjoyed your presentation, Julian. I think it is a very pressing topic and one, um, I suppose, uh, largely neglected in, in architectural education because the discipline is subjected to um, a multiplicity of pressures that are kind of beyond the discipline and sometimes it kind of tends to neglect its core values. Uh, I found interesting the uh, Heimat as um, defined by earth, sky, mortals and gods. I think 
I was wondering whether sky is to worth what gods are to mortals. So there is this kind of correlation between, I suppose, belonging and longing for something beyond. Um, and, and I found that uh, quite interesting. And then you talked about, uh, I, I'm not sure if you were making a suggestion, but you talked about mechanisms of participation in architectural design as ways to absorb the poetics of inhabiting. That's how I understood it. But, and and that's, that's an incredibly difficult question. We know that participation is something very, um, how can I say, appealing, compelling in our discipline as part of the process of architectural design. I, I mean participation of residents and prospective inhabitants or users. But also those people are People are transients. That's a moment in time in the life of a building because the building stays, people comes and goes, and they move in and move out. Uh, and and I still believe that um, by reinforcing that sense of uh, or the notion of home in architecture education, maybe uh, maybe it's the job of the architect because architectural design is perspective, isn't it? it we, we try to anticipate what home might feel like. And it's also empathetic, uh, I think inherently empathetic. It empathizes with people's needs. Um, but on this quest for poetics, there is uh, quite a sad, I think, recognition on my side, and I, I don't think I'm alone, that the capitalist system that has a huge impact on the way that architecture and other professions operate. Capitalist system has absolutely no interest in two things that I think are fundamental for our human condition in the world, poetics and quality. Uh, and, and I think that's, uh, that's why discussing these things with a room in a room full of students is um, is so important. And then one thing that I noticed that was absent from your presentation, and I wanted to ask you. Um, so you didn't mention the word longing, but I think I think it is there when you mention nostalgia. Nostalgia is kind of longing for something that is not with us, not yet or no longer. But what is the role of nature in this equation? Thank you. <coughs> So thank you, Bruno, for the question. I'm seeing that Austin is making some uh, very um, beautiful and also um, pressing signs for time because we have a lecture starting off in the same space. And I think it's very much a conversation that should be continued. And I think we wouldn't be doing this um, super interesting question, Bruno, that you asked justice by a kind of finishing off it in a very <coughs> short uh, moment. So if that's OK, maybe let's hold that thought and uh, let's find a way to continue the conversation in another format in a, 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 another um, uh, to, I think of the many opportunities that we hopefully will have to continue that conversation. Um, so thank you once again for all the questions uh, to our respondents um, Ralitza and Kenza and also to you Julian. Um, and let me finish by just um, uh, announcing the next iteration of the PhD lunchtime talks, which is going to be teams only next Monday from one to two by Pietro Pezzani, tracing the boundaries of governmental decision, computational techniques of classification and the global human settlement layer. So we can look forward to that. Thank you once again. Thank, Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Sorry to be here. Uh... No, no, it's all. <laughs>